Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for having me here this afternoon. It's a real pleasure to join what's obviously been a really fascinating and important day. So um, I was, when I was thinking about what to say today, I was reflecting on the wild 18 months that we've had. Um, and it just really has been quite a time. It feels like politics has sort of put pollsters out of business and we've just lurched from one surprise result to another. Um, and Liberty doesn't take a view on the outcome of any of these things, but it has been pretty astonishing to see the outcome of the EU referendum swiftly followed by the arrival of a new Prime Minister, the inauguration of Donald Trump, a snap election, and then a surprise result in that election too. And since then, I've been pretty glued to the news as we've seen the political developments unfold very, very rapidly um, with human rights issues suddenly coming onto the agenda that we really didn't expect, like reproductive rights for women in the last few weeks as the deal with the DUP was done. So it feels like a very exciting time to be thinking about human rights, and it does also feel like a very exciting time to be thinking about doing things about human rights. One of the things that has really defined my first year in this job as Director of Liberty has been that the rhetoric at times, uh, particularly from our elected representatives, has really plumbed some new depths. And I say that it's not everyone, but there are some people from across the political spectrum who sometimes use their language to stoke fear and division rather than cohesion and unity. It seems at, time that, at times that security will always trump liberty, that dissent will always be condemned as disloyal, and that political whim can sometimes trump democratic debate. So in many ways, I think this is the year that we tore up the rule book, and that many of the things that we used to do and that we thought worked really well suddenly maybe don't look like they work so well anymore. And again, that feels like a great opportunity. Now, my life's motto has genuinely always been that there's no fun without rules, which obviously made me an excellent lawyer, um, but a really tragic teenager. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that I've really had to grapple with in my whole working life uh, in human rights, but also particularly in the last year, is what do you do when the rules get broken by the people who are meant to uphold them? How do you speak truth to power when you can't be heard above the din of fake news? How do you champion protest when dissent is seen as bad behavior? How do you give a voice to marginalized people when populism seems to reign supreme? And for you in particular, how do you all, as public servants, uphold the values of human rights and integrity, which of course no doubt drew you to this work in the first place. How do you uphold those when you face great public scrutiny, often great public criticism, and public cuts? So I stand here today with no naivety about the fact that there are real challenges facing the public sector, that these are hard times for those of us who believe in privacy, that they're hard times for those of us who believe that the accident of nationality shouldn't determine what rights you are entitled to, and hard times for those of us who believe that politics without compassion can be a very cruel game indeed. One of the things that has been very striking is that some of the battles that I think we thought were decisively won and consigned to the dustbin of history have come back round. So I had a very chilling moment one morning uh, when Theresa May had gone to visit Donald Trump. And I woke up, like many of you no doubt do, to the dulcet tones of the Today program. Um, and there was a conversation happening about torture. And no doubt, in the pursuit of impartiality and balance, they had one person on who was condemning torture outright. And then they had someone on who was saying, well, you know, there are times when perhaps it might be necessary for sovereign states to do certain things that liberals might feel uncomfortable with. And just like that, as you're drinking your tea in the morning and you're listening to what must be one of the most genteel and civilized radio stations in the whole world, just like that, you realize that sometimes the things that we thought were settled can become very unsettled and battles that we thought we had won need to be defended all over again. So, 
in moments like that, I can feel a little bit like the roof is falling in. And I find myself, as a rule lover, reaching for the architecture, the things that we have in place to protect us and protect ordinary people in, in this country. So I think about the European Convention on Human Rights and I think about the Human Rights Act and I think about the Equality Act and the Modern Slavery Act and all these wonderful pieces of legislation which in black and white suggest that we should live in an incredibly civilised and decent society. That's, of course, the architecture of a movement for civil liberties and human rights and progress and equality of which you have all been a part. But I realise now that I think we do have to fight to keep that architecture standing and I think as we renegotiate our European relationships and as we confront an unpredictable and turbulent politics, as we recognise that many people who we seek to defend and empower feel left out and left behind, I think we really have to work hard and work hard together to hold the line. So we have to work to protect the Human Rights Act and our membership of the European Convention. And we have to work to make sure that all those hard-won rights and equalities protections are kept part of our laws during the Brexit process. Of course, at Liberty, that's very much our bread and butter. That's what we do day in, day out, that kind of fight. But what I really want to try and communicate to you all today is that you are absolutely vital to the success of that work. You are great human rights defenders. You are the people who are upholding human rights in ordinary and important ways every single day. I came to human rights from a quite a legalistic and academic background. I'm very proud and lucky to be able to say that I have never suffered a human rights violation. And that's a great privilege. So I don't pretend to be able to speak for the people that I often have represented. But what I came to realise through my work, first as a barrister and now at Liberty, is that what can perhaps look or feel like a very dry and legalistic framework is actually very visceral, very emotional, very human. And I had so many examples of times when I had conversations with people about human rights meaning something to them. And those people were very often my clients, but they were also very often the public servants that I was working with and sometimes working against. I stand here as a result of those conversations really, really optimistic about the future. It feels like, and the theme of this conference today totally backs this up, it does feel like this is the year that activism is going mainstream and that you don't need to be someone who chains yourself to railings or goes on protests to take a little bit of activism into your daily life to really stand up for the things that you believe in. When I started out as a lawyer, as I say, I, I came to the idea of human rights from a fairly dry and academic perspective and knew and was totally convinced that for someone like myself, I never had any religious faith, but when I lighted upon the human rights framework, it seemed to me that it provided a set of values that I could subscribe to in an almost religious way. And there were many, many chapters in many of the books that I read that explained very clearly why human rights were essential to protect the citizen from the overweening state, to uphold the rule of law, to be the balancing feature of a majoritarian democracy. And of course, written down by great legal minds after the horrors of the Second World War, enforced by great legal judges over decades since, and endorsed by all the civilized nations of the world. I loved that human rights are not political in a party political sense. They are, of course, deeply political, but they sit above and beyond the turbulence that we might find in our political hubs. I love that they are secular, but also not incompatible with religion. I love that they are designed to be operational tools that can be flexible to the demands of policing or combat. I love watching the way they operate a constant balancing act between the needs of the individual and the needs of the community. All of those things, academically and theoretically, were more than enough to convince me that human rights was a very powerful framework, and I think should be more than enough to convince pretty staunch skeptics that they're a very powerful framework. But as I say, as I started to work in this world, I realized that there was a much more potent and profound reason for signing up to this human rights agenda. 
one which perhaps thinkers and lawyers and politicians and perhaps sometimes public servants don't come to as quickly as they do come to the academic understanding of things. And that's when I came to realize that most people that I have met understand why human rights are important on a deeply cellular level. I learnt that as a legal aid lawyer, representing, as has been said, sometimes some unpopular causes and some unpopular people, I learnt that I could walk into a room with any client or any family and that we could find some common ground and that the adversity that they were facing meant that it expanded their worldview to understand why it was important for other people to have the rights that they were entitled to. Very early on in my career at the bar, I represented a family whose teenage daughter had died. She'd taken her own life very tragically um, in psychiatric care. And the circumstances of that case, and anyone who is involved in these areas will be, I suspect, sort of sadly familiar with the kinds of failings that came to light in that inquest. So she had arrived onto a new ward, a very vulnerable young woman, a very frightened young woman, and she had sat waiting to be processed effectively in a corridor. And there was a CCTV camera in that corridor, and she sat on a chair, bent over, shaking, you could see, visibly distressed. And she sat there for three hours with people walking past her. And no one, not one person in that three-hour period, stopped to say hello to her or ask her name or check that she was getting the help that she needed. There were many other technical things that went wrong relating to observation checks and medication and of course the inquest system is designed to learn the lessons of all those things. The saddest detail of all I think and it sort of was a continuation of that first scene of her sitting on her own was that when she was found by some of the staff at the ward having tied a ligature around her neck in her room and they called 999 and the paramedics arrived the paramedics walked into the room and there were five staff members from the psychiatric ward there and they turned to the staff members and said what is this young woman's name and none of them knew that she was called Gemma and I remember sitting with her family and her dad worked on the railways and her mum was a social worker and her brother was training to be a police officer they were real they were a public service family um, and I sat with them having a cup of tea in one of the breaks and we talked about the inquest and we talked about what my role was and some of the things that had been revealed and the family started saying when when Gemma first died the hospital contacted us and said that we, sh we shouldn't worry too much because they were going to do an investigation and the mum said you know it was it was so odd because we just felt it wasn't right for the hospital to do the investigation. We felt that the hospital shouldn't be the ones investigating how she died. There needed to be an independent investigation. And of course, that's what they have a right to. That, in that moment, this woman was articulating one of the central limbs of Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. She didn't need to be a lawyer, but she had a gut instinct that an independent investigation into a death in state care was absolutely essential. She went on to say that she had thought, she had hoped, that when her daughter was admitted to psychiatric care, that there was some obligation on the doctors and nurses to protect her. She was a vulnerable woman. Didn't they have to protect her? And, of course, they were right about that, too, because under Article 2 and then also under Article 3, there is this positive protective obligation to protect vulnerable people like Gemma when they come into contact with the state. And that protective obligation is not just if you're on a psychiatric ward. That's the obligation that means the police have to investigate crimes, rape and domestic violence. It's the obligation that means you've got to protect kids from racist attacks or from LGBT communities from hate crime. That was just one conversation of literally countless conversations when human rights for me were brought to life and it was shown to me that lawyers later had realised how to codify those instincts into something black and white, but that first of all, they had been very important human instincts. I think all of you probably really understand that because perhaps more even than a legal aid lawyer, you will be coming in, for many of you, you will be coming in contact with people day in, day out who express themselves in that way. And you will no doubt have understood why it was so important for the Hillsborough families to finally prevail last year after so many decades of fighting for justice. I think public servants, perhaps more than anyone, understand why the framework 
meets the reality in such an important way. And I think I would challenge anyone to talk to any of you or to talk to me or to talk to any of those families and come away thinking that human rights were something that we could play fast and loose with. I think sometimes the human rights community can be a little adversarial, and I say that knowingly as a lawyer, um, and I think perhaps there are times when the public sector doesn't feel as though we are open to having conversations and working in partnership with the public sector. I think it can feel like a very oppositional world when there is a death in custody or a death in psychiatric care and on every side things are serious and people feel that they have to be defensive and litigation looms and litigation very often is bad for everyone. But what I want to be really clear about today and I speak on behalf of Liberty but also I think on behalf of the whole human rights sector now is that we really welcome working in partnership with everyone who works in the public sector. We truly see you as very important human rights defenders, and we see ourselves as public servants. It's always a great sadness to me, in fact, that legal aid lawyers aren't seen as belonging in the same group as doctors and nurses and social workers and teachers. And over the past year in particular, I've had very many conversations about why human rights are important and essential for public service work. So I've talked to police officers and they've explained to me why being able to balance the right to protest with the right to protect people from violence provides them with a framework for which they can organise literally how they do their shift patterns and how many people they have turn up to a protest. They say that before they had Articles 9 and 10 that taught them about proportionality and necessity and interference, they didn't have a structured way for making those decisions. They talk about the way that Article 3 and the obligation to investigate crime has meant that they can mount a very hard-edged ask for more resources to investigate sexual offences. I've talked to doctors and nurses a great deal about how the right to physical and mental integrity under Article 8 has been so essential for them in navigating complex and very often deeply difficult ethical decisions, putting the dignity of the individual and the rights of their families right at the heart of medical decision making. We've talked to teachers who are having to navigate the prevent duty and how to try and use safeguarding in schools to spot people who are vulnerable to radicalization, but of course to other things like child sexual exploitation, without using the prevent duty in a way that discriminates against Muslim communities and isolates children in their classrooms. I've talked to social workers about how the right to family life is an amazing tool for helping them make the incredibly difficult decision of when to take a child away from a family or when to step into the domestic sphere and inject resources and support so that the family can stay together. Of course, after the last few weeks, housing officers are reflecting on Grenfell Tower and they are reflecting on the fact that the right to safe housing is perhaps something that all of us haven't been talking enough about in recent years. Prison governors too, and I used to do lots of prison law, but we're increasingly having conversations with prison officers and prison governors, and I know you've heard about this in more detail this morning, about how putting human rights at the centre of our penal reform system can be incredibly powerful. Whether that's weaving fairness into processes of adjudication, or whether that is just making sure that rehabilitation is at the heart of the system, genuinely living that perhaps trite phrase that we are only as good as a society as the way that we treat our prisoners. So all of this is human rights in action. All of it is operational. All of it is flexible and dynamic, and all of it can work in the complex situations that you will be facing day in, day out. Of course, it's a very powerful way of making sure that that otherwise very imbalanced relationship between the citizen and the state can have some equality of arms. And of course, the other thing is that you're all just human beings and citizens, and I think what's also very important is that quite apart from whatever you do in your day job, you feel emboldened to defend your own rights and the rights of your families. And I hope that for that reason you will be very engaged in the big conversations that we are going to be having over the years to come about Brexit and about our rights in this country, about surveillance, about deportation, about our immigration system and about hate crime. For us at Liberty, of course, we will be making it very clear what we think the red lines are in all of those debates. But I think now more than ever, unless we are part of very big, very broad coalitions in that conversation, there is a danger that we will become irrelevant to ordinary people and that we will be drowned out by people in politics who don't necessarily want to hear what we have to say. So 
what we at Liberty hope for is that we can create a movement that is very, very inclusive, that has at the heart of it people with the real experience of the issues that we are talking about and the people who have the real experience of having to put human rights into action. So that means that some of our work you may not agree with, but lots of it you will, and lots of it will be relevant to what you do. So we're going to fight very, very hard to make sure that the government can't access everyone's private data, whether that's your medical data from the NHS, whether that's the time you searched for a Samaritan's phone number or an abortion clinic address or an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting online. We want to make sure that where you protest and where you pray is not something that falls into the hands of the state. And we want to make sure that you can all do your work without the Home Office looking over your shoulders. We want to make sure that if you're a doctor, you don't feel that your patient might be deported because of information that you gathered from them. We want to make sure that if you're a teacher, your classroom is not going to be turned into a border. And we want to make sure that if you're an MP or a councillor, the sanctity of that relationship between your constituents is protected. We also want to make sure that whistleblowers are not criminalised. And of course, so many of the greatest and most important whistleblowers have come from the public sector and have provided a vital voice and a vital way of shining a light on areas where we need to reform things. So I hope that over the coming months and the coming years that we can have a very big, broad and ambitious conversation about the kind of country that we want to live in. I think it's, like I said earlier, there's real reason to be optimistic. We have seen tens of thousands of people signing petitions. People are joining protests, they are supporting cases, they're joining liberty, setting up local groups, forming coalitions, sitting around the table with people who before, they may have said that they don't really have anything to say to each other. So it feels like we are becoming much more united and with that becoming very powerful indeed. I think that we can together build a whole nation of activists. I think we can fight against the rules that diminish our freedom and our dignity and use the ones that make us freer and more dignified to empower us and the communities that we work with. So your work is vital and you are really powerful and I think that you can all be great forces for good in this world and great human rights defenders. I hope that today and you inviting me here is just the beginning of a conversation of how we can work really closely together in the months and years to come. So thank you.